A Brief History of the Middle East by Dr. Yaron Brook. Good morning, everybody. This is the history of the Middle East. Today's first class is the rise of Islam. End of World War II, the world was in shambles. Uh, Japan had just been devastated by the Allied forces, as was Germany. Europe lay in ruins. One part of the world which had uh, actually survived World War II relatively in good shape was the Middle East. And indeed, there were a lot of high hopes during the 1940s and early 1950s for what lay in the Middle East's future. Here was an area, again, that had survived World War II, that had plentiful oil reserves, that had a, a plentiful natural resource, so their economic survival seemed to be guaranteed. They were going to get lots of uh, dollars in their future. Colonialism was ending. There was a lot of optimism about the uh, Arab nationalism, the establishment of new countries uh, in the Middle East. There was clearly a strong Western influence on these countries. They were adopting what people believed to be Western ideas. So if you, we look back just 60 years, there is this view of the Middle East as going through its own little renaissance. Yet, of course, 60 years later, Japan, Germany, the Far East, all these devastated countries are in fantastic shape relative to where they were 60 years ago, certainly. They are thriving economically. They are free politically. And yet the Middle East is in horrific shape. In spite of receiving billions upon billions of dollars from oil revenue, from in Western investment in those oil resources, in refineries and pipelines, in spite of receiving government grants from Western countries, loans, subsidized goods and services from Western companies, both private and public money, free expertise. These countries have gone nowhere and have indeed slid backwards from where they were 60 years ago, both politically and economically. The region is devastated by war. In you know, in the context of what goes on in the Middle East, the Palestinian-Israeli problem is not that big of a problem. If you consider, for example, the war between Iran and Iraq that lasted eight years, one of the longest wars of the 20th century, and in which at least a million people died. So war has been ravaging this area. Its population is amongst the poorest in the world. Its economy is growing at the lowest GDP growth of any region other than Sub-Sahara Africa in the world. It is a violent culture and a violent place ruled by horrific despots. Saddam Hussein just being one among many. There is no freedom, no freedom of speech, no private property, no freedom of movement. GDP, the G average per capita GDP of Arab countries is $3,700. Compare this to Israel's GDP of $18,000 per capita. So in spite of all this oil revenue, in spite of all the investment, in spite of the billions of dollars the U.S. pours into that region, this region is among the poorest in the world, with a population of close to 300 million with 60% of that population under the age of 19, with 75% of all Egyptians who leave high school cannot find a job, and a per capita income on average of below $500 a year. So what we've seen is an area that the West, at least, had high hopes for just 60 years ago in complete devastation. We've also seen 
over the last 50 years. A significant increase in activities and power of militant Islam, of a fundamentalist Islamic view of the world, and a decline, a systematic decline of the influence of Western ideas on the region. This power of militant Islam probably peaked with Ayatollah Khomeini's takeover of Iran, and of course became most evident to the West on September 11th. So what happened? What happened over the last 50 years, 60 years, to bring this region to the state it's in today? What happened in the last 60 years to make September 11th possible? But more, what happened? What has happened to this culture? If we travel farther back, if we go back a thousand years, we find that in the same geographic area, in this Middle East, the same religion, we find a thriving culture. A culture, you know, in relative terms, you know, a thousand years ago, a culture with science, with philosophy, a respect for logic. So what happened? What happened since the 1950s? What happened a thousand years ago? A lot is going on in this part of the world. And this is what we're going to be talking about in the next five hours, spread over five days. Not all at once. Now, of course, I think the motivation for finding out what happened is clear. It's in a terrorist activity targeted against us. It's in our dependence or supposed dependence on the oil of the Middle East. And it's in the headlines, the daily headlines, about the Israeli-Palestinian-Israeli-Arab conflict. So hopefully at the end of this course, you will have a much better understanding, and after my lecture on Friday, a much better understanding of why we face this terrorist threat, and what we can and cannot do about this part of the world, and what Israel is really going through, and why. Okay? Now please feel free to raise a hand if you have questions uh, while I'm going. I'll try to leave time at the end, but... I don't promise that I'll have the time at the end to leave. OK. Now what you've got there is a pretty um, anemic map, anemic, I guess, of the Middle East. And this is pre, pre-Islam, but it's, it's the best I could find. This is, the, this is kind of division between uh, the Arab tribes of uh, pre-Islam. So let us begin. The Middle East before Islam. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot about this. But we need to consider the fact that this region is the birthplace of civilization. All the ancient civilization started here from uh, the Babylonians and Assyrians that are in what is today modern Iraq to the Egyptian civilization to the ancient Hebrew-Israeli civilization, and of course the Greeks are way back here. And indeed, from very early on, this whole area is ravaged by wars. This is really the area, geographically, that bridges Europe, Asia, and Africa. And if you look at that tiny slither of land called Israel, it is really on the pathway between all three continents. Israel, of course, is also the birthplace of Judaism and Christianity. Now, this, the people who lived in this region survived, particularly, uh, particularly in the desert, survived primarily off of the trade routes that exist between Asia, India, China, and the rest of Asia, Africa, and Europe. Ooh, so much hair for a newborn. We need to start planning his baptism and his holiday outfit, and ooh, his birthday party. Sure, but um, how long are you planning to stay? 
If you're one of those who goes to meet your newborn nephew and stays until his first birthday party, switch to Cricket Wireless. Use your phone as many days as you want in Mexico without extra cost. Smile. You're on Cricket. Requires eligible plan. Minimum $55 per month. Data speed usage and other restrictions apply. Coverage not available everywhere. See store for details. I'm in Glendale and found love in the South Bay. Yes, I find myself in an L.A. long distance thing. Yes, who helped make it work? AT&T. I bought one phone, got another one on them. And romance is alive on the 101. Come into an AT&T store, buy a smartphone, and get one on us. More for your thing. That's our thing. Limited time in areas. Select devices. Each requires up to $900 on installment agreement. Requires one new line of minimum $75 per month service. Free after credits over 30 months starting within three bills. If cancel service, device balance is due. $30 activation, additional fees, taxes, and restrictions apply. See your local AT&T store for details. Now, with the uh, spread of Christianity and the conversion of the Emperor Constantine to Christianity at about 311, he lived between 311 and 337, or ruled between 311 and 337. The Romans established an Eastern Empire with a capital at Constantinople. That's in what's today Turkey. So one empire is set up on the east, on the west, which is the Byzantine Empire, basically the Eastern Roman Empire. In the east, you have an Iranian Empire, a Zoroastrian Empire. Zoroastrianism was the uh, religion of the Iranians. It was a kind of monotheism, monotheism. Um, although it, was, it had dual entities of, uh, of a god and a Satan struggling, and there's a, there's a very strong tradition there of this battle of good and evil that uh, I think, as we'll see, Islam picks up on, on this idea that there are two deities out there that are struggling for control, that there's good and evil as metaphysical existence and reality that are continuously in battle. Now, the Arabs inhabit the Arabian Peninsula, that is where modern-day Saudi Arabia is, this whole area, all the way down through what today is Yemen and Oman. And this is inhabited, this is all desert. It's inhabited by Arabian tribes, nomads for the most part, very few cities or towns. They live off of trade. They live off of, of trading caravans, bridging again the east and the west. They thrive particularly when the Persians and Byzantines are at war. Because when the Persians and Byzantines are at war, the only trade route, the only way to get around the battlefield is through Arabia. And that's when they do particularly well. It's a very tribal culture. Uh, the only real cultural achievement, if one can call this, and I have no way of evaluating whether this is uh, true or not, but according to the books, the only real cultural achievement is poetry. They are known as poets of, uh, you know, of the desert. And in this world of tribalism, in this world of these nomadic tribes, we, uh, we get the rise and the birth of Islam. Now, Muhammad is born in Mecca. Now, Mecca is on the western side of the Arabian Peninsula. It is the most prosperous city and a pagan sanctuary. It is a backward city as compared to the cities of Byzantine and Persia. But again, relative to this region, this desert, it is a center of trading. It is an oasis. The regions surrounding it are all inhabited by these nomadic tribes who are crossed through Mecca on their way to the west with these caravans of goods from the east. Now during the time Muhammad was born, probably around 571, the Byzantine Empire and the Persian Empire were at war. And Mecca was relatively thriving. They were doing well. But they were, you know, this was a, uh, this was a backward little place. Within 50 years, 
it becomes the center of a new world. Now Mecca is also a pagan sanctuary, as I said. Uh, this is where the pagan gods, you know, the, the holy places of the pagan gods, they reside. And we'll see, uh, we'll see how that uh, plays out. It, you know, the, the, uh, the main deity of Mecca at the time was called Allah. And that's where Muhammad gets Allah as the terminology for his God. And indeed, the holy place was uh, this rock, the Kaaba. And of course, that later becomes an Islamic holy place. Now, Muhammad is born around 571 to a noble but not very prosperous branch of Mecca's leading trading family. He's raised by an uncle, Abu Talib, who teach, teaches him caravan trade. He becomes a commercial agent for a rich widow, who is 15 years his senior. When he's, and when he's 25, she asks him to marry her. She bore him four children, all daughters, no sons. And while she was alive, she was the only wife he had. Now, let me note about uh, Muhammad's biography, just as an aside, that we don't really know anything about Muhammad's life. Muhammad's biography was written about 125 years later, after, he, after his death. It was uh, oral history put into writing. Uh, details of his life have been questioned by both Islamic and Western scholars. You know, the, just like Jesus' life and all, any of these prophets' life, they are, you know, speculations that range from the guy never existed to every word that, you know, that describes his biography as the word of God and therefore is true. Uh, I take the view that what's really important is what people think Muhammad's life was like because that is the model they use. That is the ideal that they project. So what I'm giving you is kind of the standard story on Muhammad. Now at age 40, he receives a revelation, a prophetic revelation. Now according to some, this first, at first this distresses him. He doesn't know what's going on. An angel appears, starts talking to him. But his wife, who is his first convert and closest companion, persuades him that this is God speaking to him and that the visitor is none other than the angel Gabriel. Now Gabriel's first words to Muhammad are, quote, recite, you are the messenger of God. Now, Muhammad uh, receives these revelations from Gabriel and starts telling people about them. And as you'd expect, people think the guy's crazy. And the vast majority of Meccans, you know, laugh at him. They think he's just insane. And they reject him completely. Now, they tolerate him as long as he doesn't interfere with business. And business here is trade, but it's also pilgrimages to the holy sites of the pagan gods. So, you know, the concern that they have is if Muhammad is now going to spout that these pagan gods don't exist and there's only one god, they're going to lose business from these, you know, from the people who are coming to worship these, uh, these deities. The business generated by these pilgrimages to the Kaaba which is a cubic building the size of a small house in whose exterior wall there is this black stone, uh, probably a meteorite. And that is, that is what is uh, worshipped by, uh, by these pagans. Now, what saves Muhammad is protection from, by his uncle, who is relatively powerful, a powerful merchant, and is highly respected. Now, what's interesting is that early on, in order to kind of get along and to survive in this uh, environment, Muhammad 
actually sanctions the worship of other Meccan gods. Then a few days later, he comes back and he reverses this, saying that it was a message from the devil, not God, and that there is only one God that should be worshipped. Now, the reason I bring this up is because these revelations, the revelations that there are many gods, that it's okay to worship many gods, are actually called by Muhammad later the Satanic Verses. This is, of course, the name of Salman Rushdie's book 14 centuries later, because they were supposedly inspired by Satan. And so as a result of now he's sticking to this monotheism, right, he's upsetting the Meccans. They're not happy. They start humiliating him. They start throwing rocks at him. He's slowly starting to build a group of followers. It peaks at about 100. They're being abused, and their life is being threatened. And after his uncle, his protector dies, and his wife dies, in, 16, in 619, he decides to leave Mecca, to leave it with his followers, who, as I said, are about 100. He travels to Medina, which is a, a little oasis 280 miles north of Mecca. Medina at the time is inhabited by warring tribes. And they invite Muhammad to come to Medina to be the arbiter of local disputes, to be the local judge. And the leading tribes are willing to accept his new religion in order to gain some peace, in order to resolve, to help resolve some of these tribal disputes. Indeed, the Muslim calendar starts year one, is this year of exile, the year he leaves Mecca for Medina. This trip is called the Hijrah. Muhammad in Medina begins his career as a political leader, as a spiritual guide, as a supreme lawmaker, and as commander-in-chief. One of the unique things about Muhammad, and as a consequence about Islam, is that the leader is the leader of everything. He's not just a spiritual leader, he's not just a political leader, but the spiritual leader is the political leader, is the military leader. This is also the beginning of a community, a community with political power, with a military force. Islam during this period increases dramatically in numbers as these tribes in Medina become convert to this new religion. And Muhammad grows in confidence. Now, many of the authoritarian principles that are embedded in Islam come from this period of time, come from this experience in Medina. As I said, all executive, judicial, legislative, and religious authority rests with Muhammad, rests with the Prophet. Now, ultimately, according to Islam, they all rest with God. That is, everything Muhammad does is told to him by God, to the nitty-gritty details of day-to-day -day life. So all these authorities are God's authorities. There is no realm in which human beings can function without being told what to do by God. There is no leave unto Caesar what is Caesar's. There is no separation of the spiritual and temporal authority. Government is the government of God, of God's word. This is the purest form of theocracy, if you will. Now, Muhammad, during his stay here, as I said, is the absolute ruler. And everything, all his legislation, all his pronouncements, are phrased in terms of prophecies, are phrased in terms of, this is what God told me to tell you. This is God's law. Now, 
during this period, Muhammad has no formal police force. But he relies on a group of young zealots who enforce the Prophet's word. And again, I bring this up because if you look today at the Arab world, particularly at fundamentalist Islam, you note that many of these countries have these small, young, these groups. They usually function in small groups as small gangs who go around enforcing the word of God. You see this in Saudi Arabia. You see this in Iran. You see this in Egypt. Where the responsibility for enforcing religious law is left, in a sense, to the mob. And this goes back to Muhammad's time. Muhammad also has no standing army. There's no bureaucracy. There are no government institutions at all. There is Muhammad leading, you know, calling the troops to arms, leading them into battle. There's Muhammad who is the lawgiver. There's Muhammad who is the leader in every aspect of day-to-day -day life. Muhammad also establishes the, uh, the, uh, kind of the, the way in which Muslims are going throughout their history later on to treat their enemies. Oh, so much hair for a newborn. We need to start planning his baptism and his holiday outfit and, ooh, his birthday party. Sure, but um, how long are you planning to stay? If you're one of those who goes to meet your newborn nephew and stays until his first birthday party, switch to Cricket Wireless. Use your phone as many days as you want in Mexico without extra cost. Smile, you're on Cricket. Requires eligible plan. Minimum $55 per month. Data speed usage and other restrictions apply. Coverage not available everywhere. See store for details. I'm in Glendale and found love in the South Bay. Yes, I find myself in an L.A. long distance thing. Guess who helped make it work? AT&T. I bought one phone, got another one on them. And romance is alive on the 101. Come into an AT&T store, buy a smartphone, and get one on us. More for your thing. That's our thing. Limited time in areas. Select devices. Each requires up to $900 on installment agreement. Requires one new line of minimum $75 per month, sir. Service. Free after credits over 30 months, starting within three bills. If cancel service, device balance is due. $30 activation, additional fees, taxes, and restrictions apply. See your local AT&T store for details. He often forgives his enemies. He often tries to bridge the gaps as long as they all are willing to become or are good Muslims. He tries to do away with the tribal blood feuds that exist between the tribes. But at the same time, one of the things he hates the most and resents the most are intellectuals that rise up against him. And intellectuals in the context of Medina of the 7th century are primarily poets. He hates being mocked in verse or song. And indeed, soon after a raid, uh, on, on, uh, on, one of the one, on a tribe, on one of these nomadic tribes, uh, in which there is a particularly irksome critic of Muhammad, Muhammad sanctions the murder of this critic. In a sense, this is Islam's first politically sanctioned murder of an intellectual opponent. This is a female poet. Now, he does this by asking... The question, I guess that Shakespeare uses later, who will rid me of this daughter of Mawan? And of course, somebody obliges that very evening. A few months later, he is bolder, ordering the death of a second critic, a poet, and this time accompanying the assassin and blessing him just before he commits the crime, which sets the precedent of these fatwas that where, where the, the suicide bombers are, you know, go to a religious spiritual leader just before they set off on this journey and are blessed. Indeed, these are the first examples in Islam of terrorism, of the attempt to terrorize any kind of opponent, intellectual opponent of Muhammad. This period in Medina is also the beginnings of the tension between the Muslims, the new Muslims, and the Jews. Now, originally, Muhammad de decrees, you know, that as long as the Jews and even pagans fight alongside the Muslims against Mecca, 
who are his enemy now because these are the people who kicked him out, or any other external force, and they refrain from doing any wrongdoing to the Muslims or helping the enemies, they would be treated with sincere friendship, exchange of goods, good counsel, fair conduct, and no treachery between them. So he establishes the idea of freedom of religion. As long as you don't betray me, you can worship whoever you want. And originally, in order to appease the Jews, in order for, the, for him to be liked by the Jews, he actually has the Muslims, when they pray, pray towards Jerusalem. So when they bow down and pray, they originally pray towards the Jerusalem. But the Jews actually mocked Muhammad. It was clear to them that what Muhammad was doing in formulating this new religion was taking a little bit of Judaism and a little bit of Christianity and mixing up a little bit of tribalism from Arabia. And they kind of thought this was pretty funny. Here he was misappropriating stuff from their holy text. And they gave him a hard time. As a consequence, Muhammad bans the praying towards Jerusalem and shifts it to praying towards Mecca and ultimately Mecca's Kaaba. As uh, later on, this is also an attempt to appease the Meccans. And keeping Kaaba as a holy site does what? It guarantees that there'll be pilgrimages to Mecca for the, till the end of time. As long as they're Muslims, people still travel by the hundreds of thousands to Kaaba to worship the stone. A tradition that was a pagan tradition. He then expels one of the Jewish tribes in Medina, a member of which supposedly tried to assassinate Muhammad. Another Jewish tribe flees, and one tribe is left in Medina. In, 1620, in 627, after surviving a siege in Medina by 10,000 Meccans, uh, Muhammad breaks the siege, defeats the Meccans, and he accuses the last Jewish tribe in Medina of treason, of supporting the Meccans. The story is that he, uh, he finds uh, a dying, one of his dying soldiers and uh, asks this dying soldier, how can I avenge your death? What should I do to these Jews who have betrayed us? And this dying soldier says, basically, kill them all. And indeed, Muhammad refuses to let them leave Medina, and as a punishment, he beheads at least 600 Jewish men in one day. And he makes the women and children slaves. And of course, they, all their property is seized. Now, in the tribal world of Arabia, beheading 600 people in one day gains you a lot of respect. Force is admired. And your willingness to do something as brutal as that is admired. And indeed, it's a huge political success. Jews do not rise up against Muhammad again, at least for another 600 years against Muslims. The Jewish tribes become subservient to the Muslims. They get the message. And the tribes of Arabia start flocking to Muhammad. Here is a real, here is a leader. Here is a leader who is winning. Here is a leader who is willing to act. As a consequence of his uh, of his uh, gain in confidence. He's now ruling over the city. He's now got, you know, he's a lawgiver. People show him all this respect and admiration. Uh, he is ready to challenge Mecca. And he starts attacking their trading caravans. He starts defeating their armies. And after the Meccan siege over Medina fails, Muhammad signs a treaty 
with the leading tribe in Mecca. The treaty is a peace agreement for 10 years. But over the next two years, Muhammad gains strength. He gets more tribes to convert to Islam, more tribes to accept him as their leader. And in 630, he uses a relatively small, infra relatively small infraction of this treaty by the Meccans as a reason to declare war. While the Meccans try to dissuade him, at this point, he is too powerful. And indeed, Mecca surrenders, and he enters the city triumphant, the city that kicked him out. He enters as its new ruler. Now, this issue with the treaty is just interesting, again, bringing us to current events. Uh, Yasser Arafat, in 1994, in a private meeting in uh, South Africa, is claimed to have said, this is 1994, so it's a year after he signed the Oslo Treaty. Right? He has said, it, it is said that he, uh, it is claimed that he said, I quote, I see this agreement being no more than the agreement signed between the Prophet and the Koresh, which is the leading tribe in Mecca. So uh, from that point, Islam, when signing these types of peace treaties, and, and they sign many of these treaties later on in their uh, wars with the Europeans, you know, view these as, you know, conveniences, tactical, uh, tactical instruments to give them time to gain more strength. They don't view these as binding documents. I'm in Glendale and found love in the South Bay. Yes, I find myself in an L.A. long distance thing. Guess who helped make it work? AT&T. I bought one phone, got another one on them. And romance is alive on the 101. Come into an AT&T store, buy a smartphone, and get one on us. More for your thing. That's our thing. Limited time in areas. Select devices. Each requires up to $900 on installment agreement. Requires one new line of minimum $75 per month service. Free after credits over 30 months, starting within three bills. If canceled service, device balance is due. $30 activation, additional fees, taxes, and restrictions apply. See your local AT&T store for details. So, Muhammad enters Mecca and establishes the Islamic faith in place of the pagan beliefs. He is relatively, um, let's say he's not as uh, brutal with the Meccans as he was with the Jews in Medina. He kills only ten people on his entrance, and these are again the people who are most vocal in their opposition to Muhammad. They are the you know, intellectuals, if you will, to the extent that you can t call them that, of the time, the intellectual opposition. Once he returns to Mecca, he turns his attention to other Arab tribes in the region. He defeats them one after the other and becomes the most powerful military presence in the Arabian Peninsula. In 630, Right after he's arrived in Mecca, he leads an expedition towards Syria. Syria's up here. Leading 30,000 men, which is a huge army in the context of that time. Many, perhaps most, of the nomadic tribes of Arabia are now have either adopted the faith or allied with him. Now, Muhammad's condition, uh, the, the way Muhammad approaches these tribes, and the way uh, Islam approaches these tribes, at least uh, over the first uh, century or so, is that the tribes either convert to Islam or they are put to the sword. Of course, you get massive conversions when you are the most powerful military presence in the region. And Islam grows dramatically during this period. Now, Muhammad dies in 632. According to Islam, his prophetic mission is complete. His purpose had been to restore monotheism, which had been taught by all these earlier prophets and had been abandoned, according to Muhammad, and distorted. His goal was to abolish paganism 
and to bring God's final revelation, embodying the true faith and the holy law. According to Muhammad, he was the last of a whole string of prophets. He recognized the Jewish prophets. He recognized Jesus. He just thought that the Jews and the Christians got it wrong, or at least have been corrupted over time. That he was resurrecting the same basic faith. Muhammad, when he died, left no instructions about succession. He was the last prophet according to Islam, which is, of course, very convenient. But we'll see that this lack of succession leads to significant recurring conflicts in the history of, of uh, Islam. Indeed, the disputes within Islam are not about theology. They're not about interpretation of the holy texts. The disputes in Islam are political. They're about who should rule, who should be the successor to the prophet. The inner circle of Muhammad's followers meet. These are now men of Mecca, which is another split that occurs within the Islamic community. The men of Mecca who originally rejected Muhammad and then accepted him, and his original followers who went with him to Medina, who accepted his teachings in Medina. There's a political, initial political split. But the men of Mecca, who are wealthier, who are more successful, install Abu Bakr as Muhammad's successor, as a caliph, thereby establishing the caliphate, which is the supreme sovereign, the supreme sovereign office of the Islamic world. Now before we go on with more history, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about Islam itself some of its basic tenets. Now, as I said, Muhammad, according to Islam, is a prophet. He is God's messenger. He is not like Jesus, or as the Christians view Jesus. He is not a divine actor. He is not the Son of God. Indeed, one of the biggest criticisms that Muslims have of Christianity is that they raise Jesus to this, idea, to this uh, view of the Son of God and the Holy Trinity, and they accuse Christianity of not being monotheistic because they have many gods. Jesus as another de deity, another god. Muhammad is more like Moses, like the Jewish prophet. The words spoken to Muhammad become the Quran, the holy text. A word, the Quran, uh, combines the word reading and recitation. Recitation. And indeed, uh, Muslims learn the Quran by heart. They recite it from memory. Muslims believe that every word in the Quran was told to Muhammad by Gabriel. So by God, basically. And the Quran was supposedly recorded during his lifetime on little scraps, on leather scraps, on flat camel bones, whatever available material they had that they could write on. And all these scraps were preserved until they were later combined into the Quran. But it is not Muhammad that combined them. These are just, the, the Quran is basically the sayings of Muhammad. The verse constitutes According to scholars, I have no, no way to evaluate this. Supposedly, the verse of the Quran constitute the first, and according to many, the finest example of Arabic rhymed prose. It's supposedly beautifully written and inspiring. To Muslims, the words written in the Quran are divine and eternal. They were always there. Okay. So the Quran, and there's this big theological debate of whether the Quran was written down or whether the Quran is eternal. That is, the words of the Quran had existed even before God created the earth. And you can really get into interesting debates. Uh, according to the, the, the Muslims, the alphabet existed before the existence of, before God created the universe, the alphabet somehow existed. So. 
And, and indeed the Jews, if you read the Kabbalah, the Jews believe this as well. And it gives letters and words in Hebrew and Arabic metaphysical power, supposedly. They have metaphysical significance because of, of their origins with, you know, within God. Now the Quran has two voices. In Mecca, when he receives his first revelations, it is the voice of a rebel. In Medina, it is the voice of a statesman, of a head of state. In Mecca, you find it particularly concentrated on religious dogma. In Medina, you get detailed day-to-day -day instructions of how to live, of you know, day-to-day -day activities. And of course, laws, military conduct, all of that is during the Medina period. Now again, supposedly the Quran is unchanged. Although, you know, there's no historical evidence that it hasn't been tinkered with, and who knows where you even came from in terms of its original origins. Now in addition to the Quran, the Muslims have the Sunnah. The Sunnah are sayings and actions of Muhammad that are not necessarily revelations from God. And again, this was all put together after his death. The holy law, the Islamic holy law, the Sharia, as they call it, was only again systematized after Muhammad's death. And indeed, until the ninth century, Muslim scholars believed that you could reason, and by analogy and personal judgment, you could interpret what Muhammad wrote, said, and that's how they created this body of law. Uh, during the ninth century, they decided that it was all over, that they had decided all the important questions, and interpretation was finished. There was no more interpretation of Islamic war law, supposedly, from the ninth century onward. Now, what does Islam, what does the religion say? Well, what does Islam mean, the word? Islam, the world, means submission. Submission to God. Islam is the submission of one's actions and thoughts completely to God. It refers to the ritualistic rules that each Muslim must obey. These rules are symbols of the Muslim submission. They pray on their knees five times a day in complete sublimation as part of this ritual of submission. Now, I've heard people say that Islam means peace, and you hear that a lot. It only means peace in the sense that for the Muslims, submission is peace. When you submit yourself completely, you gain this peace with God, with other people, but you are peace as a slave, peace as a non-entity. It does not mean peace in a sense of uh, you know, peaceful relationships among individuals or among countries. Islam is a relatively simple doctrine that does not demand much of people other than giving themselves up completely. <laughs> but once they do, the rules are pretty simple and laid out. Remember, this was a religion adopted by relatively primitive, simple, tribal societies. To gain entrance into heaven, Muslims must believe in and pray to one God and share their wealth with the poor. Those are the two basic things. They have to say every morning that God is one and they have the commandment of spreading their wealth. The five duties, the pillars of the faith, Oh, the first and most important one is professing that there is one God and that Muhammad is his messenger. The primary responsibility of humanity, according to Islam, is to remember that there's only one God in all one's thoughts, actions, and words. Again, remember the context. This is a tribal pagan society that they're trying to force into 
the, this notion of monotheism. The second pillar is praying five day, times a day, facing Mecca on your knees, face to the ground. The third is the Ramadan, fasting from dawn to sunset for one month a year. The fourth is paying alms, donations to charity. And the fifth is pilgrimage. <laughs> Notice how convenient for the Meccas, Meccans. To be a good Muslim, you have to make every effort during your lifetime to visit Mecca, to visit the holy rock, the Kaaba. It's a great way to appease the Meccans and guarantee them that income flow. Now, an unofficial pillar of Islam, not one of the five, is the duty of jihad, the duty of holy war. Dying to spread the faith cancels out all sins and leads straight to paradise. Now, uh, according to modern interpretations, according to interpretations of the last few hundred years, jihad is primarily concerned with the preservation of one's own belief. It's an internal struggle between good and evil. And you are spreading Islam, I guess, by keeping yourself a good Muslim. But jihad actually means, and, and at least according to the fundamentalist, what jihad means, is spreading Islam, the vision of Islam. The ideal for the Muslims is one world ruled by the Muslim faith. And any way in which you can achieve that is jihad. So if for the moderate Muslim, if living by example, that is living as a Muslim, showing the world how happy and content and successful you are, turns them other people into Muslims and spreads the word, that's jihad. If it's by going out there and setting up mosques all over the Western world and slowly converting people and, and turning them into Muslims, that's jihad. If it's conquering them and slaughtering anybody who doesn't want to become a Muslim, that's also jihad. Okay. But the, the notion that the whole world needs to become Muslim is common to all interpretations, ultimately, all, I think, legitimate interpretation of what jihad means. I mean, uh, Islam takes seriously the idea of spreading their religion, of converting the whole world. This is God's message. This is God's gift that they are giving to mankind. And this is, this is, the Muslims don't invent this. I mean, this is a theme in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's the responsibility of the Jews to be an example to all people. So all people will ultimately see the light and become and recognize God's glory. Now, the Jews are not commanded to turn everybody into Jews. Quite the contrary. They are supposed to remain as an example. Uh, but the Christians certainly are encouraged to go and convert everybody into Christianity. Okay, now as with all religions, you know, Islam is creationalist. There's a huge debate within Islam about free will. You know, like in every religion, it's a contradiction. They believe in an afterlife. Heaven and hell are very real in Islam. Much more like Christianity than Judaism. Now Islam is also very collectivistic. It is very concerned about the community. It has an egalitarian spirit to it. What is important is one's commitment to the faith. Not one's wealth, not one's tribe, not one's ethical, ethnical, <laughs> ethnic origins. In that sense, Islam is a universal religion. It's not an Arab religion. At least there are more non-Arab Muslims today in the world than there are Arab Muslims. The emphasis is on material welfare for everyone in the community. The entire community is responsible 
for the welfare of every one of its members anywhere in the world. And you see the enormous uh, uh, funds flowing into these Muslim charities, whether ultimately they go to terrorists or not. The enormous amounts of money going to these charities with this notion of trying to spread this wealth so that because every Muslim is responsible for every other Muslim within this Islamic community that spans now over a billion people. There's also no real authority in Islam other than the Word of God. In a sense, there's no orthodoxy. There's no church. There's no pope. Again, far more similar to Judaism than Christianity. They are uh, spiritual leaders. But they don't belong to some hierarchy within a church organization. The term heresy does not exist within Islam. There is a negative term thought of as innovation. Innovation is bad. The Quran sets it down and that's it. The true belief is the original belief. That's it. There's very little, until, for, except for a very short period, about three, four hundred years, there's very little emphasis on any kind of intellectual aspect of religion. Theology, as we understand it as it applies to Christianity, the study of the religion, is again, in Islam only for about 300 years, we'll, we'll see that period, kind of the golden age of Islam. But it disappears after the 13th century. There is no really theological studies. There's the study of the one religion, but that is it. One other topic that is addressed by the Quran that I want to uh, briefly mention, uh, because it's, just, it, it's made the news, and that's the treatment of women by Islam. Uh, and slaves. The Quran explicitly sanctions slavery. And it explicitly sanctions the inferior status of women. Although it softens and improves both the slave's condition and women's condition relative to their conditions under tribal society. Muhammad was a politician. And he accepted many of the tribal rules and customs that existed. And some of, the, uh, some of what's in the Quran in terms of dealing with women and slaves are barbaric, even in the context of the time. For example, a husband is allowed, according to the Quran, to beat his wife, to physically abuse his wife. But others, again, in the context of the time, are more progressive. Like you cannot inherit a wife. In tribal society, a wife was property that was moved around. And when the husband died, a brother usually inherited the wife. The wife in Islam actually inherits part of the estate of the husband when he dies. Far better, for example, than uh, what was going on in Christianity at about the same time. They inherit half of what any male is inherit, but they inherit something. And indeed, in early Islamic times, some of the wealthiest people were women, widows. Remember that Muhammad's first wife and first convert was a very successful businesswoman. Muhammad also limits the number of wives a man can have to four. Now, that sounds funny, but Judaism doesn't limit it at all. According to Judaism, you can have as many wives as you want. There's nothing in the Old Testament that is monogamous, and indeed there's nothing in any, in the Talmud or Mishnah or anything, that prohibits having as many wives as you want, other than the one wife you do have that prohibits the rest of the wives. <laughs> So much hair for a newborn. We need to start planning his baptism and his holiday outfit and, ooh, his birthday party. Sure, but um, how long are you planning to stay? If you're one of those who goes to meet your newborn nephew and stays until his first birthday party, switch to Cricket Wireless. Use your phone as many days as you want in Mexico without extra cost. 
Smile, you're on Cricket. Requires eligible plan. Minimum $55 per month. Data speed usage and other restrictions apply. Coverage not available everywhere. See store for details. Oh, so much hair for a newborn. We need to start planning his baptism and his holiday outfit. And ooh, his birthday party. Sure, but um, how long are you planning to stay? If you're one of those who goes to meet your newborn nephew and stays until his first birthday party, switch to Cricket Wireless. Use your phone as many days as you want in Mexico without extra cost. Smile. You're on Cricket. Requires eligible plan. Minimum $55 per month. Data speed usage and other restrictions apply. Coverage not available everywhere. See store for details. So, uh, you know, the veil, for example. Uh, the veil was introduced in Medina. Uh, and it was uh, introduced by Muhammad as a consequence of the fact that he didn't like other men looking at his wives. He tended to marry the prettiest, the youngest, of, uh, of the women uh, in Medina. And uh, in, in order to uh, feel more comfortable about the letting of his wives roam around the marketplace, he introduced the veil as one of the uh, commandments. Uh, one of the stories about Muhammad is he, uh, at some point he married a, a nine-year-old girl. Aisha was her name. Uh, indeed, she is, uh, uh, her son becomes a, a significant figure uh, for the Shiites, uh, for the Shiite Muslim. Uh, although the marriage was not consummated until she was 12. That makes you feel better. But, you know, again, this is tribal practice of the time. This is uh, regular. Now, it, just to give you again an example of how Muhammad used this position effectively, uh, at some point, uh, there was a rumor that, his wife, that, that uh, one of his wife was committing adultery. And uh, uh, Muhammad, who didn't want to believe this, obviously, because uh, uh, this was one of the wives he liked, uh, got a revelation from God saying, and it, saying that in order to prove adultery, you had to have two witnesses who actually saw it happening. <laughs> And, of course, she was uh, exonerated. And, and, but that is in Islamic law. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole body of law on how to prove adultery. Okay, so we at the point where uh, Islam as a faith has been established. We'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the difference between Islam, Judaism, and Christianity uh, next time. Uh, Muhammad has died. His successor is starting out. And we are at the threshold of really the, uh, you know, the, the incredible success uh, of Islam in the world, primarily militarily, but as we'll see, also culturally and politically. So thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. This course continues with Lecture 2. So much hair for a newborn. We need to start planning his baptism and his holiday outfit. And ooh, his birthday party. Sure, but um, how long are you planning to stay? If you're one of those who goes to meet your newborn nephew and stays until his first birthday party, switch to Cricket Wireless. Use your phone as many days as you want in Mexico without extra cost. Smile, you're on Cricket. Requires eligible plan. Minimum $55 per month. Data speed usage and other restrictions apply. Coverage not available everywhere. See store for details. Oh, so much hair for a newborn. We need to start planning his baptism and his holiday outfit. And ooh, his birthday party. Sure, but um, how long are you planning to stay? If you're one of those who goes to meet your newborn nephew and stays until his first birthday party, switch to Cricket Wireless. Use your phone as many days as you want in Mexico without extra cost. Smile, you're on Cricket. Requires eligible plan. Minimum $55 per month. Data speed usage and other restrictions apply. Coverage not available everywhere. See store for details. Bull 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 everywhere. See store for details.